I never write notes down. I'm an off the cuff person. Yeah. I know. I didn't bring the well aware. The frying pan or the. Oh, you didn't bring the palote or the frying pan. Okay. You're going to have to, man. Hey, one on each side? <laughs> You know that story, right? No, my mother got worse soul. She used the rolling pin. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah, nice. So I'm going to bring it kind of get a rolling pin. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. When someone comes in and complains, doesn't want to go Hey, heaven knows. I've got to earn, he's got to earn my respect somehow. <laughs> I don't think that's going to work. Either. No, yeah. My mother was a wooden spoon lady, and I ended up with a spoon. Did you really? Mother still has that palota in the door somewhere. I just can't. Oh, really? Yeah, I just can't. You know, I, I go to her her house. She left me the, I told you, she left me the six bedroom, four bath, monstrosity. And because we had a huge household. You're in the place. Magic Tom. And, and um, I keep on saying Magic Tom. You know, so when she passed away, she looked at me like everything. Right. And uh, I was like, what am I going to do with this? You know, and then psychologically, it's tough to go into that house because there's a lot of ghosts there, a lot of memories. Well, I don't know. Yeah, it's real tough. Did you text her? Did you text her? You need to tell the audience that we're waiting for her. So she, when she makes her dramatic entrance. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, hey, Dana. Dana, if you have your phone, can you call her? Satisfaction, but yeah. he's not on the panel. Yeah. Oh. No. <laughs> See? <laughs> he's going to come up with all sorts of questions. Just so mean. <laughs> sir, is it true that you're a fascist? <laughs> <laughs> a better question. No. Sir, when did you stop? Okay. That's, that's yeah. the answer. How did you do it? <laughs> Sorry, you're probably uh, oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think the word you're looking for is Trumpista. <laughs> Trumpies. 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 Yeah. There's a what now? There's a wind. How many? There's only 17 emails. <laughs> only. <laughs> Nobody agrees, and I even said I would be there. It reminds me. There reminds me of a student. It's it's uh it's like a week before final exams, and I was and back in the day before I put everything online. This is like 20 years ago. You know, stack up your, your blue book. I mean, your essays, right? And she walks in late, and she there's there was an essay. Turn paper during this class? Yeah. She said, there was a turn paper during this class. Yeah, it's, it's in the syllabus that I handed out the first day of class. She goes, oh, I never read the syllabus. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> why start now? Yeah. Why exactly? Why start now? You might as well get started. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, I'd like to thank everyone for being here. It's very nice of you to participate. I'd also like to thank uh, our, our panel here. We have Dr. John Flanagan, who drove all the way down from Wise County to participate in this, Professor Nick Pugh, uh, Professor uh, Jenny Jones, and Professor Daryl Castillo, and hopefully a Professor Daly, who's down in Granbury today, might be able to make it up here uh, today, but you never know. That traffic, who knows? Uh, the road construction can get you. Uh, so we really appreciate everyone being here. Now, I'm gonna, I have a list of questions, but please feel free to, to raise your hand and ask your own question. I'll just raise your hand. I'll call on you. 
We just ask that you be polite and moderate, and just because someone disagrees with you does not mean you start screaming and hollering at them. That's her outside. All right, so. <laughs> and Facebook, of course, Facebook. Control all that. All right, so our first question, I'll start it off with our first question, which is, uh, Donald Trump has been president for 14 months now. How would you rate his first year? More precisely, just what do you think was his greatest accomplishment in his first year, and why? And what do you think was his greatest failure or failing as president? And who would like to start? Wow. Dr. Flanagan, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you. You notice how we were all students and looking down. I know, I know. <laughs> I'm used to that, though. It's okay. Yeah. Um, well, when I'm, I, when I'm looking at, at, at President Trump, I think a, a couple things. Um, first of all, he got elected. So um, yeah, that, that in itself is a, is a accomplishment. And of course, people are still trying to parse that out and figure out why that happened the way uh, that it did. But I think uh, for Trump, uh, in terms of his greatest accomplishment, it's probably getting tax reform through. Uh, the way that he did. I mean, because Trump has come to the White House as an outsider, he doesn't have. He didn't really come from a political background. I think he had a. He has a difficult time um, understanding how government works, particularly because I mean, he, he came from the business world, and the business world works differently than government. You know, um, and the fact and and early on, of course, he had some some real problems uh, in terms of working with Congress. Uh, particularly trying to repeal Obamacare, um, which you know was uh, you know something that people thought was just going to happen as soon as you got a Republican Congress and a Republican president, and it didn't happen. And I think in getting uh, the tax reform bill through, he was able to uh, hold together his congressional coalition, um, and, and even then it was kind of questionable. Um, but I mean, they, they need. He needed that. He he needed he needed to show that he could do it and he could govern. Um, because if he couldn't do that, I think he would be in a much worse place uh, than he is. But I think uh, that was probably, at least for me, kind of looking at him, um, probably his greatest accomplishment, at least in the for, for first 14 months. I would add on to that because both the, the tax bill and the repeal or somewhat repeal particularly of the individ, uh, individual mandate both uh, are, are aspects of the economy, both affect the economy and I would say that that is one of his greatest achievements with us being nearly at a, uh, the jobless rate being the lowest it's been in decades, uh, African American employment, Hispanic employment being the lowest it's been. Um, I think that is a, uh, as far as what, what he wanted to do, that was a tremendous achievement for him. Okay. So I would probably give us the administration's performance a C minus, but I was grading it. In terms of his greatest accomplishment, I think, I'm hoping that it actually ends up being a dialogue with North Korea. The tax reform and the other legislative matters are perfunctory to some degree. Um, things that were that should have happened given the fact that the, the Republicans now control both houses and the presidency but opening a dialogue if we if we can accomplish this will be bizarre and potentially genius to have a, the president who refers to the leader of North Korea as little rocket man be the guy that actually opens the door would be tremendous um, I think that his to answer the other part of the question, you know, what is the greatest failing in the past 14 months? And I think that it is that he has legitimized rhetorical divisiveness that continues to push the parties apart from each other in a manner that is becoming more and more tribal. That is that party above all else as opposed to party of good governance. I know that many people have said that we want a president who is familiar with business. We should run the government like a business. And I take exception to that. Because in business, there is one and only one goal, and that is profit for the shareholders. That's it. And if anybody says that business is about something else, they're wrong. Government's function is not a function of profitability. 
And if we run government as though it's a business, we run the risk of the moral ambiguities that may also fall under a system where you are trying to derive profit at the expense of everything else. So I'm giving him C right, C minus right now. Well, Trump is not a Republican. Never has been a Republican. Uh, he's an outsider. Um, as a uh, political scientist, who's also a historian, I, I think that uh, he's comparable to an Andrew Jackson with a bit of Churchill in there, because like Churchill, he's not welcomed by his own party. He's considered an outsider by his own party, uh, and, and I think that 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 uh, that's advantageous for for the president. Uh, because uh, that allows uh, him to be his own man and can fight the good fight for the little guy, even against his own party. So I think being being an outsider, you know, Trump Trump is not a conservative. You know, he's not he's not an ideologue, uh, and he certainly uh, decided to run uh, as a Republican with an R by his name simply uh, because it was advantageous to do so on that side of the ledger as opposed to to the other side of the ledger. Uh, is he an opportunist? Well, obviously he's an opportunist. Uh, and I can tell you right now, you heard it from Professor Castillo first, that he's going to cancel the meeting with Kim Jong-un at the last minute. Why? Because it's advantageous for him to do so. Okay. Any questions? Any other ideas? Yes, sir. How do you guys feel about the high turnover rate in the Trump administration? Really high. How do you feel about the high turnover rate? Though? It's axiomatic, is what you said. He's running it like a business. Yeah, I mean, t exactly. I mean, if, 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 if this was a business and I was a shareholder, I think at this point we'd have to have a talk about what was happening at the top level of the company. We would certainly be having that discussion if I felt like I was, a board of, I was on the board of directors. I would want to know why the turnover is so high. Turnover in, in a business like that is going to indicate that you have a cultural problem that's not good f for the shareholders. It's not good for the people invested in the company. And if we're expected to treat the presidency and government as a business because of this idea that Trump is a businessman, then we have a cultural problem. That, that, that's, that would be my first concern. But I mean, I don't know. I don't know what to think because it's never been quite like that. What I think, I think part of the problem too is you know, when, when Trump was running, he ran as an outsider, and so he was outside of that Republican establishment, and so he had to kind of go to the fringes to find people. Um, and then when he got elected, he brought those people into office uh, with him, and in many ways they didn't fit, or they were problematic to Trump once he became president. And I think Trump is just kind of going through people. And, you know, he, 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 you know, you look at somebody like Rex Tillerson, right? He, he picked Rex Tillerson because he didn't know Rex Tillerson, um, but he knew he was an executive, and he chose him for that reason because in, in Trump's mind, if you were an executive, then you could run the State Department, you know? Um, and once Tillerson, you know, now, now again, you can argue about what Tillerson did with the State Department, and that's a whole other argument. Um, but Trump just didn't agree uh, with Tillerson once he got kind of behind the will, um, and then ultimately he just, you know, he, he got to that point. And, and again, you can see it with other people. I mean, you know, he just kind of goes through people. He thinks he's going to have somebody who's going to do what he wants and say what he wants to. Um, but unfortunately, you know, for Trump at least, you know, when you get to that level of, of the bureaucracy, um, you're going to have egos and you're going to have people who want to kind of go their own way. Um, and I, I, just, I just think that, again, it's kind of axiomatic of, of just the Trump administration altogether. Although certainly some of that, it goes with the territory. I mean, oh, definitely. I mean, you're going to have higher you're, turnover yeah. to begin up with, but his has certainly been higher than, um, than Obama's or Bush's. Yeah. Well, but, but again, I mean, it's just, I mean, the, 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 when, when you're looking at kind of administrations, when they're being set up, you can kind of look, you know, if you look at other presidents as they go in, I mean, they, they basically have people um, uh, kind of lined up for those types of, of jobs. And, I, and again, I think Trump was just kind of um, surprised that he won the election, too. Um, you know, and again, there's kind of an argument about that, um, all kinds of stories about that. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, you're you're just seeing this kind of tremendous turnover, and it's you know it it, 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 it without without kind of a continuity uh, in leadership that does become kind of hard to kind of to lead. And now, and now again, just one more thing, not to monopolize the conversation, but Trump kind of likes that too, I think, because I think you know. In terms of his personality, Trump thinks that he can do it. He, he, I, I you know, he, he has, he is a, a, a man of perfect confidence. Right? He, he believes in himself, um, and I think in many ways he just kind of thinks that many of these positions are just kind of um, uh, for window dressing, um, and, and basically he can, he can do all of his jobs. Um, but uh, we'll see. Well, micromanaging certainly isn't presidential quality, is it? No. <laughs> I, I disagree. I don't think he's confident at all. He's, he doesn't. I don't. I don't see him. I don't see an individual confident in what they're doing because there is a never-ending litany of how awesome he thinks he is. But I don't. I don't hear that from people who are confident because they don't have to. Well, he, well he's, he's he's confident on the surface. I mean, but, but I mean, he's very thin-skinned. I mean, every, I mean any, any anyone who criticizes the president is, you know, just you know, Twitter bait for him. Um, you know, and that's something else that you know is unusual about Trump too. Is you know, he he can be very petty and he can be very vindictive and he goes after people on, on Twitter, which is unusual. Now, again, it's unusual for a president. You know, it's not that people don't do that because a lot of people do that. Right, but the question is: Is do you want that type of person being your president? You know, that's kind of the that's kind of the the, the question there. Well, evidently, uh, the electorate did. Yeah. Well, e evidently, the electorate wanted somebody who doesn't have a filter. Right. Well, that, that that's true. It, it served him very well. You know, um, in terms of, of of going out. But you know, I mean. I've spent two years hearing these theories about Trump and what Trump is and trying to explain Trump, but I mean really he's, I mean, if you, if you look at kind of the classical definition, he's just a demagogue. I mean, he flatters the people um, and he goes out uh, and, and I mean, he kind of fits that, that, that definition kind of very well. Um, and he's much, he's much more kind of focused on presentation than content. Kind of building up, let me ask another question. How would you compare the first year of the Trump presidency to presidents of the past, Jackson or whomever? Hmm. Well, you said Jackson, so it's you. Well, yeah, <laughs> but, you know, I, 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 I didn't, I, you know, I, I, I didn't serve in the Jackson administration. <laughs> I, I did serve in the Reagan administration. Uh, and so, uh, in comparison to that, uh, you know, uh, Obviously, the same charges that, and it's like deja vu all over again. You know, the same charges that I hear leveled against Trump uh, back in 1980 after Reagan won the election were being leveled at Reagan. Where was that cowboy? You know, he's got his finger on the button, and you know, we're 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 all going to be doomed. I mean, it's it's it's, it's, it's eerily familiar to me, uh, having lived those moments and living. Uh, these moments of, of how the uh, vindictiveness from the other side is just as vociferous against Trump as it was uh, against Reagan. Uh, so, I, you know, I really, uh, I, I think we sell Trump short. You know, yes, he may be demagogic. Yes, he may have a thin skin. But, you know, even though you have uh, your dad help you with $12 million to give you your start, right? Uh, it does, uh, it does, does still take some degree of intellectual acumen uh, to to arrive at, at a place where Mr. Trump has arrived at, the President of the United States. I mean, you know, so I, I don't sell the guy short. I don't think he's a loose cannon. I think he enjoys uh, the uh, attention of being a loose cannon. Uh, but I don't think the man is a loose cannon. I think appearances are deceiving in this case. Any other question? Yeah. <clears throat> I have a question asking, um, do you feel, or in your opinion, anybody's opinion, do you feel you know, our society has changed so much over the years where um, I guess I would say a loose society, you know, everybody has a right to this, that, and the other, and do you feel like Trump, 
you feel like the, the way the reason why he acts the way that he does sometimes is to appeal to the way our society is today to um, reach out to those people that are just talking or um, I don't know maybe just reaching out to the type of our society today that he's he is acting towards how people want him to act so that he can get their attention about what's going on not being able to say that the way oh, I absolutely you, but do you yeah. feel like he's trying to just relate yeah. to our people but yeah, I mean, because, you know, we, we live in a reality world TV, you know, it's a reality, it's a reality TV for us now. We live in a world without a lot of filters. We, you know, we, we like, you know, overblowing, you know, activities and, you know, people who speak their mind. And I mean, I, I mean, Trump tapped into that. I mean, he, he, he under, he, I mean, he understands, he understands that. I mean, remember too, I mean, he had a, you know, he had the apprentice for, what was it, 14 seasons or something like that. I mean, he, he under, he understood how to, find an audience and, and, and keep an audience and, you know, entertain people. And, I mean, he uses that. I mean, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you know, he can be a demagogue and he can be other things too, you, you know. Um, but he, he under, you know, there's a, there is a, there is a, a skill set there that I think Trump honed. And, I mean, a big part, I mean, you know, a big part of Trump is, and he, he said this before, is, you know, he understands how to brand something, how to market something. You know, um, and I remember this because it was an a, a interview he gave a couple, many years ago. But he, he would talk about how, you know, um, it was Trump was the brand, and that was the brand he was selling, right? That's why he puts it on the side of buildings and on stakes or whatever, right? Um, and people would buy it or use it uh, because of that, um, you know. And this, you know, the stakes weren't particularly better than any other stakes, but they were Trump stakes, and that's what attracted people. So, I mean, he he understands how to do that. Um, and again, being a being a politician, that's a very important skill to have. You know why people don't like government? Because they don't like to look in the mirror. <laughs> and we're getting a really, really tough look in the mirror this go around. There's nothing that will send me into fits of rage in class at least in, in my federal government class, like hearing people say, well, we, you know, it's those damn politicians. You know, they don't, they don't just show up. That's right. We put them there. That's right. And then we complain again and again. Well, that's the democratic again. process, though. I understand. And I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that. It's just this time we're looking in the mirror and we really don't like what's being reflected back at us. And that's fine, but... We have to shed the tendency to focus on the man because we know what that is. And I think we gotta look at policy and we gotta look at the way that government should be managed. And those are my concerns with it. He, his mouth, all of the things that he says, I can't imagine anybody is surprised. We've known what he was gonna say for the 30 years he's been in the spotlight, or however long since the 80s. That's fine, and that's an easy thing to complain about. He said such and such on Twitter. Well, no kidding. But getting to the root of the policy, what does he really want to accomplish? That's the, for me, that's the part of the mirror that we're not, we're not looking towards. We're looking at the eyes going, I don't like the hair. But we're not looking at the policy. Although I think people generally, particularly his supporters, think that actions speak louder than words. And they know what to expect from him, like you're saying, as far as tweets. And they're more interested in what results, what policy results is he getting? Yeah, this is the difference between a a, uh, a perspective and retrospective. I mean, uh, are some people having buyer's remorse and having voted for for Donald Trump? I suspect they are. Uh, some, some, perhaps a few. But uh, I mean, I, we don't don't underestimate the guy. I mean, you know, and, and I, I want to take. Some some degree of an opposite view of what you just said, okay? I'm sorry. Uh, you know, the, uh, you know <laughs> po policy, you cannot separate policy from personality. You know, personality is policy. I mean, it's the force of personality that, 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 that uh, proposes and then, or disposes of, of policy. So if, this, if uh, this, this president that we have today uh, didn't have the personality that he has, some of the policy positions wouldn't even be germane because it takes somebody as outrageous 
uh, as this individual to propose these, uh, these policies. Now, are the policies themselves outrageous? Uh, some of them might be construed as outrageous. I mean, you know, I was just speaking about uh, uh, retrospectives. I mean, you know, um, I voted for Donald Trump. I mean, I held my nose when I voted for Donald Trump, but I was going to be goddamned if I was going to vote for Hillary Clinton. Uh, so my, my, my vote was more of an anti-Clinton vote than it was more of a pro-Trump vote. But am I having buyer's remorse? No. The only thing I'm in retrospective is where's the, where's the damn wall, okay? I want the wall built, okay? Uh, and, and, I, and I defy anybody in this room to call me a racist on that issue. Uh, and so, you know, uh, so where, 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 where's the wall, okay? Uh, yes, we have a win on the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals that there are no, no, going to be no more sanctuary cities. Yay! Uh, for our side uh, here in Texas. Uh, so, yeah, there are some things retrospectively uh, that are like, but has he fulfilled all of the, uh, all, all of the, all of the promises? Uh, as we said earlier, n no, not really. I mean, he's, uh, I, would, I would dearly have loved to have seen Obamacare repealed or at least starved of funds, okay? But uh, he's on a learning curve and knowing that he's going to have to play ball with the leadership, the established leadership of the Republican Party, who's only, uh, obviously being politicians, whose only objective is to get themselves reelected. So they're not going to have a problem throwing Trump at whatever opportunity under the bus. Well, now I have to take exception to your exception. <laughs> <laughs> because if policy and personality are linked, and our window to his personality is his behavior up to this point, then I'm going to have a hard time with the policies of a man who is said, I didn't sleep with a porn star, but then sues her to keep her from talking about it. The man who says, I have money, and that entitles me to touch people the way I feel like, women the way I feel like. If these are the windows to the man's personality, and that's linked to his policy, then all of his policies are suspect. That's my only concern. Yeah. Um, if I may go separately, policy and posturing are two different things. Uh, his, uh, the president's attitude is more of a posturing. He, 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 he caters to his electorate, or should I say, his constituents, in the 30%. But his attitude as the president of the United States, tweeting, and saying awful things and derogatory things, that alienating from more competent people from the Republican Party to say, hey, I want to step up and work with this guy. So if you don't have very competent statesmen or, 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 or those who have worked in the government before to help you, you will not achieve any policy or any goal. It's just going to be posturing and they were lucky to pass the tax bill because the tax was crafted by all the Republicans. But outside of that, don't you think that his posturing or his um, uh, tweet is alienating the good, smart Republicans who can step up into his administration to help him? And that's why he has a lot of incompetent people working for him and stepping up. Oh, would, you, would you call Tillerson incompetent? No, I, I, I don't think, I would, I would say this about, my opinion on Tillerson was he wanted to do something, I think it was the wrong direction. Uh -huh. He wanted to go, um, I mean, because he, he ripped up the State Department pretty, pretty well. Yeah, he gutted very, the State Department. Yeah, very, very quickly. Yeah. Um, my friends in state, you know, they'll email me and say, oh, I can't believe this, is, you know, I gotta go defend my job or something like that, you know. Um, but I, mean, it, the, I, think, I think the point is, you know, he, he did come from, he, he didn't have any political experience, and again, I think it's true. The political world is different. It's different than the business world. Um, you, know, you can use business methods in government, but government, like Nick said, is, is not business. It's not. Um, and, and you cannot, you know, again, that argument that Trump made during the campaign was he was going to run the government like he ran his business. Well. I, I don't know if that was a, a really good I idea or not, but one of the things in government you need is you know you need expertise. But remember, there is a there is a, a, a deep seated I don't want to say fear, but suspicion of the bureaucracy, distrust, distrust, right? This idea of the deep state and the deep state trying to uh, you know. Uh, uh, 
create a, a, an unstable environment for for the president. Um, and you know, what I would say is, you know, you're you're going to need that expertise. You're going to need your party members, your expertise. You know, for as much as we hate it, the federal government is a bureaucracy, and it's a big bureaucracy. And yeah, you need good bureaucrats to run a big bureaucracy. And if you go in there, you know, guns blazing, going after the bureaucracy kind of in general, um, that, that's, that's a problem. Part of it too is because, because Trump is, is, is new to politics, um, you know, he kind of makes these general statements. And it's not that politicians haven't made those statements before, right? You know, Reagan talked about, you know, government being the problem, not the solution, right? But, you know, if you look at Reagan or uh, other presidents, they would say things like that, but then they could go, you know, they, they could use uh, their abilities like a scalpel to kind of cut away at things. And I don't think Trump has the experience. He, he still uses the words like a bludgeon. Um, he, hasn't, he hasn't developed the scalpel. Um, and so when he says something, he just kind of sweeps through, and and you know every, every everything everything gets gets hit by Trump. Well, I don't know. The one thing we learned from the Soviets was that it may be messy to try to thread a needle with a sledgehammer, but the needle will get threaded. <laughs> well, but, but eventually the needle does break, though. Too. I do appreciate all of you talking about which presidents you compare him to. Is that my question? <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Uh, President Trump, in his speeches and tweets, continuously returns to his greatest triumph, his unexpected victory. Why? Because I don't think anybody's as surprised as he is. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I think it was because it was huge. <laughs> he surprised a lot of people. Nobody predicted, hardly anybody predicted that he would win. Certainly most of the pollsters, none of the talking uh, commentators, none of the political commentators. And so it was a tremendous upset when everybody was, and particularly too because they, the media chose him as they have chosen the last couple of Republican candidates to go up against the Democratic candidates as the one they thought would be easiest to defeat. <laughs> they chose McCain for the Republicans, they chose Romney for the Republicans, and they thought who Trump- who, who chose the Republican? Nothing. The media. As far as giving them more coverage, giving oh, them oh, favorable okay. coverage, they didn't, you know, actually get them in the office. I didn't know they were voting in the primaries, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> I see what you mean. They chose well, well certainly those uh, candidates, those Republican candidates you mentioned, were weak sisters, obviously. Uh, yes, but then it's 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 also within, and I can speak with some degree of uh, some degree of confidence on this, uh, having been a lifelong Republican myself. Yeah, it's it's it started with the Tea Party. You know, the the the, the Tea Party was very very upset with the establishment Republicans, and uh, the establishment Republicans are have fallen to neocons. Okay, and the neocons are no different than the liberals. They want big government for obvious re for different reasons, obviously, but they still want big government. Uh, and so uh, those of us in the in the grassroots level got a little sick and tired about that. You know, and there was an, an internal revolution. Uh, and it started with the Tea Party. Uh, and so uh, building on that, you know, uh, we were waiting for somebody to come from the wings somewhere who was not a, a, an established player. Uh, and, and Trump fit the bill for that. I mean, I predicted Trump was going to win. If you're from the street like me, and you keep, and you keep your ear to the street, you know what's going to happen, okay? You, you, you know what's going to happen. Not, not the effete, elitist. Uh, uh, you know, individuals who believe that they have their pulse uh, on the people. That's, 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 not, that's, that's not where the pulse is. It's not in the rarefied atmosphere of academia or, or uh, the media. It's, it's just not there. It, it's in the street. And, and if you come from uh, a background uh, uh, from a lower socioeconomic level like most of us in this room come from, you know, the people were sick and tired. Uh, of, of, of the attitude of both the Republicans and the Democrats. Uh, and, and they wanted a change. And they got the change. And we, there's an old saying, we got the government we deserve, right? And so uh, we, uh, we, 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 we voted this individual in to be the, the president for the duration. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, whether you believe he's effective or not is... is uh, yeah, except it's still meet the new boss, same as the old boss. 
Yes and no. I mean, I mean, here's the real problem I can imagine for the GOP on this. Let's fictionalize a scenario where his administration implodes. He's not a third party. No. Whether he is, you know, a mavericky, non-establishment guy, he picked up the GOP banner and they gave it to him. And if his administration explodes or implodes on itself, the reverberating effect on the party will be generational. It will be a generation. What you say? In, 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 in as much as we are how many years from Clinton, and that's still the number one thing I hear from a lot of my Republican friends is some complaint about Clinton, the f bill, not Hillary. We're talking about these life, these really long-term waves that will move through the polis for years. And if he implodes and takes the GOP with them. Only if the Democrats win the House. But no, see, I, see, I don't necessarily agree with that because, I mean, you know, you had Nixon in the early 70s and you had Reagan in 80. I mean, there, there, there are ways, I mean, you know, Americans have, you know, we, we, we don't have a long political memory nope. with the, with the, unless, unless someone keeps reminding us. And with the Clintons, you had Bill, and then of course you, you had Hillary as the Secretary of State, and so that never really kind of left the public spectrum, you know. And then, and again, like I said, Trump was able to play on that. He was able to look at that, um, that long political history, and of course, you know, Bill Clinton um, was not the, was was a was a challenge, challenge um, in 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 the White House. Um, you know, um, but you know, to get back to the the question, though, you know, I think I you know, Trump likes metrics. He likes to be able to to show that he's winning, and there's nothing nothing proves that more than winning an election that you weren't supposed to win. You know, but also too, I think something else about the polls too. Uh, I w I will say this: um, a lot of the issue with polls came out of the media, because I can tell you this, as a social scientist, because I've done polling before and everything, I was looking at the polls, I was looking at the models that they were using, and I said this at the time, and you can ask people, uh, ask Kathy Johnson, because I yelled at this to her all the time from my office, um, the polls were just modeled very odd, um, and remember, polls aren't perfect, and people tend to think that a poll is, is a prediction, but it's really not, oh. right? There's an error. There's, it's, there's, it's, it's based on it, preconceptions. Yeah, it's, well, it's based. You have to model it on preconceptions. Mm -hmm. You got to say, well, who's who's likely to vote? Because mm -hmm. you're 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 trying to model something. You're trying to measure something that has not yet happened, right? And so then you got to figure out, you know, about how big is that thing going to be, right? And one of the things about Trump, of course, was was he brought out voters that uh, hadn't voted or hadn't voted in a long time? Because remember, a lot of the a lot of the polling models um, are based on likely voters, and, and the way that they determine that is they ask you if you voted in the last presidential election. Because if you voted in the last presidential election, that's a very good predictor that you're going to vote in the next one. And so if you go to someone and say, did you vote in the last presidential election, and they say no, well, then you're not in that pool anymore. And what Trump did was he was able to, to mobilize voters that hadn't voted you know, before. And again, people were surprised about that, but, you know, if you go back and you look at, at Reagan's 84 victory, I mean, Reagan did the same thing, right? Well, again, the, you, yeah. you, 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 you posit what I said. It's personalities. <laughs> yeah, if you've got a strong personality who's running for office, that person's going to win. If that person grabs the attention of the American public like Trump did, I mean, morbid as that fascination may have been, then... then yeah, yeah, but see, here's my, here's my thing, though. I mean, there's a difference between electioneering and governing. And I know Trump can electioneer. He's great at the it. The Republican right? Party has never been noted for governing. Well, the uh, Republican Party has always been the party of opposition. They have never been noted for being the party of governance. Somebody's got to govern. <laughs> yeah. But they want less government. <laughs> If, I mean, that's not, that's, not, that's not a really good sales pitch, you know, elect me, but I'm not going to But it's historically that. accurate. <laughs> oh, just that uh, exactly my point at the beginning, which was that, uh, of this question, which was that a lot of the conservative Tea Party Republicans did not want to vote for Romney or McCain, and they did not turn out to vote nope. for Romney or McCain. No, we didn't. 
And there were some Democrats who switched over as well mm -hmm. to vote for Trump. And even a year in, as a CNN roundtable showed, they're, they're happy with them. Yes. So, uh, Professor Castillo, um, I have a question. You know, you see on Twitter a lot, you know, Trump talking about North Korea. There's a lot of speculation that he has his finger on the button. And I know that you work in government for the NSA. So, in your opinion, what's the likelihood of us going to war with North Korea? The likelihood of us going to war with North Korea? I'm doing that for the microphone. Well, you know, uh, there are a few people here on campus who do know uh, you're one of them since you're my first line supervisor. But every three weeks I'm in Washington. Uh, it's like being in organized crime. You're, you're never in. You're never out once you're in. And uh, having served on the National Security Council and the Reagan administration, uh, I still remain plugged in. So every three weeks or so I'm in Washington on the weekends, uh, especially long weekends since we're off on Friday, right? Um, and I'm either giving a, uh, I'm either giving a, uh, a, a, a summary or I'm in a room where summaries are given, are uh, being given. Uh, and you need clearances for that, of which I still retain those clearances. Uh, I would say the likelihood of war with North Korea is very high. Uh, I belong to that group of individuals, and I'll say it unrepentantly, who have been asked about what should be done. I think we should nuke the North, North Koreans as soon as possible. Uh, I think that when we do that, uh, everybody will stand down, especially the Chinese. Uh, I think the Russians will shit in their pants. Uh, and I think that uh, this so-called taboo against the use of nuclear weapons is uh, window dressing, that we should have utilized nuclear weapons way before. Uh, like, for instance, in, in uh, Fallujah uh, in Iraq, the very first time American troops took, took uh, fire in Fallujah, we should have vacated Fallujah, sent leaflets and dropped them and said anybody who's on our side needs to vacate Fallujah, and we should have nuked it. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I know it's oversimplistic to say, uh, let's nuke them till they glow uh, and then shoot them in the dark. But uh, I, 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 I think Americans have, uh, have, have lost uh, the, a true realistic view of the world. I mean, remember, we're the only country who's ever dropped a nuclear weapons in anger on anybody. And I, and I think the world has forgotten that. I think they've, uh, you know, it's not enough. <clears throat> I, I'm a realist enough to believe that it's not enough that the world love us. It's not. Uh, in my mind, as an ultra-nationalist American, I, I believe that the world should fear us. I think, I think that's a better thing. I don't, I, don't, I don't care if they love us. What I do care is that they fear us. I feared my mother, God rest her soul. Uh, even to the day that she died. Uh, the last thing I feared was that she wasn't going to give me the final blessing. Fear is, is a good motivator. Obviously, fear goes to respect, and then fear goes to love. Obviously, our, our love of God stems from fear. But uh, the world doesn't fear us anymore. I think they need to relearn that. So I am trying my best in whatever few resources I have and influence I have in Washington to convince the Trump administration to nuke North Korea. Yeah, so I really don't want you to do that. <laughs> and here's the thing. The, the use of modern nuclear weapons is, is absolutely amoral. It lacks any moral standing whatsoever. Morality has nothing to do with, uh, with, the, use of, with the use of, po with the use of political does, power. It does, because we're not talking about Hiroshima and Nagasaki anymore. The United States now has the capacity to repeat those events about 512 thousand times. You're like, it's like on. arguing that you're a little bit pregnant. There's, there's no such thing. Okay? No, no, you you no. either are or you're not. No, you know? we're, 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 we're not at a point now where we're talking about devices that are even close to the same. We're talking about devices that are untested on an actual battlefield. I, mean, I understand that they're theoretically tested, but they're untested on a battlefield. And they kill in massively different orders of magnitude. And it's not the North Koreans. It's also the Japanese. It's also the western coast of the United States. We're talking about real serious stuff. And here's the thing that I, while I appreciate that we need to fear or be feared, I can understand that argument. But we, if there's a fear that we've run away from in the United States, it's that we have forgotten what the actual horror of a nuclear exchange is. Because there is no Soviet Union anymore. The big red bear is dead. And what is left is a power vacuum in the nuclear world 
that is being quickly feel, filled by people who do not have this discussion. You know, I'm an old I'm an old cold warrior. I know. And, yeah, uh, also, and, and, and I, I don't think you were even in puberty when I was serving in the White House. <laughs> but, uh, what year was that? In the early 80s. Uh, and so, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the bottom line is, you know, uh, the practical experience that I've had uh, in national security and in international relations, uh, it, it doesn't leave me any room to, for doubt whatsoever that the United States is always going to be in the right. Okay, uh, and you know I could say some things about nuclear weapons and the advancements, but then they take my security clearance away. Okay, there is a way to destroy the North Koreans using nuclear weapons. Okay? We can do that without endangering the West Coast, without endangering Hawaii, without endangering the Japanese or the Philippines. It, it can be done. We have the technology to do that. Provided we even, we even have non-nuclear technology that can do it better than nuclear weapons. But actually. that's only provided that the first Trident missile is not considered the starter pistol for the rest of the team, the rest of the runners. And that's the real concern, because we don't actually know, or at least it's not apparent to the rest of us, what Pakistan wants to do. Or, God forbid, the Iranians are actually more developed than we think they are. You know, what I, Israel might do. I, you know, I, 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 I'm a political scientist, I'm not a poet. Uh, so my bottom line is whatever is in the interests of the United States in fulfilling our foreign policy goals and eliminating any possible threats to the United States, that's our paramount objective. Well, well I, I would say I would say this. I mean, you know, I know that there's low yield nuclear weapons out there, but I mean, you're, you know, part of the problem is is North Korea is very close to other places like South Korea. If you're going to hit Phnom Penh, it's only 37 miles from the DMZ. Now again, can you do it in a strategic way? I mean, that's a, that's a military question. It's a question of, of, of capacity. Um, is North Korea a threat to the United States? It is. There's a lot of threats to the United States out there. The question becomes, when does that threat become, and I think this is kind of the argument here, when does that th threat become so great that it demands action and then what kind of action will it It became a threat when the Clinton administration started sending, selling them breeder reactors, well, which, which we it's, were it's, so it's, totally it's, against on the conservative side, knowing that this would be the end result. I mean, it's, it, but, that, I mean, but again, I mean, the idea of proliferation is, is, is something that's happening. I mean, it happened in Pakistan, it's happened in India, um, it's happening in Iran, it's happening in other places too. I mean, eventually, you know, that is going, that, that is going to, that, that's the reality of the world we live in now. Um, now, does that mean you go off nuking everybody? I don't know. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to say that you can never do that. I wouldn't want to take that off the table. But I think in this particular case, um, that, would, that would be immensely problematic to do that. Now, again, I'm just looking at it from the technical standpoint. I'm not saying that, you know, philosophically you shouldn't do it. I'm just saying that from a technical standpoint, um, Korea is a problem because of the fact that you know it's just it's really just a tiny peninsula. It's smaller than Florida. We're, we're, we're dealing with here, right? Um, so and that's what makes it manageable. Yeah. Well, nuclear yeah. we nuclear weapons are psychological. Uh, that's all no, they they're, are. They're destructive. They, well, they but but it's mostly it's stuff. mostly psychological. Yeah, I mean, there's there's, there's, there's <laughs> yeah yeah I, I understand that. But there, well, there's let's get some questions. Yeah. Yeah. Back room. Yeah. All right. So if we nuke out. North Korea, what happens to all the people that are starving and dying there? What does that look like to the rest of the world? How do we look? Hey, we're, more. We're, we're supposed to be better. Saviors. We look at saviors. We want to think that. Why not? I mean, we, we, want, we want to think that, but again, you can say anything you want, you have but people will, people will judge you by your actions. That's right. And you, you have can, a regime. Yeah, let, me, let me get this straight, right? Okay. Since when, as we American people, as an American polity, since when are we going to give a goddamn over what the rest of the world thinks? The only, the, only, the, only thing, the, only thing, the only thing we should be concerned about is the security and the well-being of our citizens. And, and in order to do that, public opinion for the rest of the world is important. 
well, public opinion of the rest of the world, and how about just a very simple, basic moral compass? Mm -hmm. We can't continue to take the position that we occupy this special place in the world and in history as moral leaders, <coughs> as economic leaders, and as governing leaders if we are willing to say that probable death that are measured in mega deaths, I always just assumed that was a ban, is okay because it's in our foreign policy interests. I'm just not ready to look at the creator, whether they are a Democrat or a Republican, and concede I went willingly to the, innocent, to the death of millions of millions and millions of people who were not involved because it made us feel more safe. What's the point? If that's the case, then that policy should begin the process of eroding away the Constitution. But the president takes the an oath of office to defend the Constitution. He does take an oath of office to defend the Constitution, but it doesn't say at the expense of anything. Oh, but that, that's think, why that person is the commander in chief. Don't you think, though, that Kim Jong Un knows that? Don't you think that that's part of the reason he thinks that we won't do anything, and he's been using that as a leverage? Correct. Well, it's a perfect leverage. Okay. Yeah. But well, but now that the Trump administration is putting pressure by by putting sanctions, thereby starving the country, he's bringing them to the negotiating table. You know. I see. I, I would. Hard, hardball works. Been, I don't know if anybody here that. lives in the real we've been, world, we've been doing but that. hardball works. We've been doing that for years, Daryl. Kim Jong-un is just playing for time with this. I mean, really. How many, I mean, times, have, how many times have we heard uh, supposedly mature people say, now remember, Billy, violence doesn't solve anything. Well, no, I'm here to tell you in the real world that violence solves everything. Well, violence All you have violence. to do is ask the people of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Violence is a tool. And you use tools in particular exactly. ways. Exactly, just as but a not tool. All the time. Sometimes you. I'm not saying this is all of the time. Oh, oh, we have a question. Uh, from, from, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no, I have a question from online. Online question is: If Trump is truly an opportunistic person, would one not expect more things to come to fruition closer to year three, so that he could have a platform to run on on hopes of winning? Uh, Interesting. <laughs> that was a good. That, that, that was a good question. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I think that's probably going to be true. I think, I think you know, Trump's. I mean, Trump. Like we talked about, it's kind of on a learning curve. Um, I think, I think that it, as he hones his skill as as president, you know, as he learns to work with his with his people and with his party, um, I, I definitely think that, that that's going to be something that that. I mean, every president tries to do that. I mean, that's not that's not new to Trump, but. You know, when year three rolls around, he'll probably come up with some uh, legislative agenda that's that's that is uh, something that that you know his base is going to be be behind, um, and he'll try to push stuff through. I'm sure. But I don't think he would have waited till year three. It's too much of an unknown. He wanted to have a big crowd at his inauguration. He wants to town every accomplishment. And you've got to front load everything before the midterm elections. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, and a, lot, and a lot of it's going to be what happens in the in the midterms. I mean, you know, because that's kind of the big question now is is what the midterm is going to be like and what Congress. If is they going lose, to like. they'll just claim it's millions of illegal votes, anyways. Well, that's true. I mean, you can claim anything. Still waiting you know, on the evidence, yeah, aren't we? Yeah. Back there? I'm going to bring back one question. Morality. How many of you got children? Anybody? How about grandchildren? I don't give a damn about anybody but my grandchildren first and my children. So the hell with people other parts of the world if they threaten my children. Didn't Trump campaign on America first? <laughs> yes, he did. I would like to say something. So I mean, you know, when we talk about morality, let's get down to the personal first and then move away from it. Uh, I'm sorry, young lady. Go ahead. As a uh, Iraqi veteran who was actually on ground who fought, I don't think nuking is the way to go. I think we will be looked at more and get the fear people fearing us more if we could solve the problem. I don't. I fought in war and I don't agree with war because war has side effects. So I just don't agree with the nuking. All right. Let's see what other questions I might have here. Yeah. Let's see what else you got. Okay, well, oh, yeah, oh, oh, what about um, President Trump bringing in people such as Ivanka and Jared Kushner and calling them senior advisors 
and putting someone so completely unprepared in charge of Middle East peace. Um, what about that? It'd be fine if they were his little advisors or had dinner with him on Sunday, but he's <laughs> he's given them a title and a place. What, and they're she very talking about nepotism? Nepotism, yes. 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 She's talking about Waterford College? Or <laughs> in, her, in, in their defense, and this isn't going to come up very often, I, I mean, Middle East peace probably not super on the table right now anyway, of irrespective of who was there. But No, of, of course, but he's bringing that in. Is that not making us, if we're worried about how we're looked at, does that not make us a joke? I would have to agree with that. Yeah. You know, that the nepotism thing, you know, it's uh, you, you, you're bringing in family members and that reeks of uh, conflict of interest. You know, uh, he, he, still, he, he still hasn't, he still hasn't divulged his tax returns. Right. You know, uh, yeah, it, yeah, if we, if we you know, I, I, you know I, I, I understand that people deserve their privacy, but <laughs> you're now president of the United States. Your life should be transparent and an open book. Uh, certainly, I mean, you know, if the Republicans went after Obama because of his birth certificate for so many years over and over again, then I, th I think that there should be some type of concerted effort to say, hey, we need, a, we need to see your tax returns, you know, uh, and, and there needs to be some transparency. Uh, what, is the, what is the law that's in place, where am I forgetting that, the law in place where you have to uh, divest yourself? Of all your holdings before you become president of the United States, it's been in the Constitution forever, right? He hasn't done. He, uh, he, yeah, he hasn't. He hasn't done that yet. You know, he has refused to do that. So yes, there are some blatant conflict of interest. I have to agree with that. Yes, uh, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Uh, but but you know, he, here's the thing that's happening. And I heard this from a good liberal friend of mine. Uh, and uh, it kind of puts things in perspective. It it, 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 it puts things in perspective, right? So there was a time, if you look at it this way, there was a time when the elite in this country, i.e. Uh, Trump's crowd, right, the elite in this country, they were satisfied with hiring uh, uh, special interest lobbies to, to represent them before the government. That was not good enough for them anymore. They got tired of that. So now they themselves have gotten themselves elected to office, and now they personally have their levers their hands on the levers of power. They're not content with using the middleman anymore. Uh, what am I saying? Uh, historically, we know that all republics fall to the right. I was going to say, I mean, rich people running for office is, 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 is nothing new, but I think, I think part of it is also, too, I mean, this kind of goes to, to Trump's experience. He's basically trying to run the White House like he did his business, and his business was a family business. It, it, I mean, it really was. I mean, it was, a, it was a multi-million dollar business, but it's basically a family business. And so, if you have that experience, and you know, you've had 25, 30 years of an experience running a family business, have been extremely successful, and you get elected president, well then, you know, why would you change that model, right? Um, Don't trust it, anybody but family, right? It, 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 it worked for him, right? It, it worked for him before, and so, it's going to work for him now. Now, how it looks, I, I would have to agree with that. I mean, you know, it, it, it looks, you know, kind of looks like amateur hour in a lot of ways. Good. Yes, ma'am. So my problem with that is that you uh, mine you got nepotism. You you give your best bets, the, the best jobs. They're not qualified to do them. The boss, uh, certain ones like the EPA, almost seem to be designed to destroy those very departments that they've been put in charge of. Um, back to what I was going to say, I had my hand up earlier when we were talking about um, the high turnover. It seems like he's constantly grooming to get the cabinet he wants, and it seems to be full of people that do treat him like a demigod, that do have the yes man, yes sir, um, going on. My problem with that is that uh, history, whether you're running it as a government or as a business, you're going to run the risk of terrible decisions being made in a groupthink environment where you're going to have, if you're going to take a government example, a bay of pigs situation, or if you want to take a business model where you suddenly put out new coke. And <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you know, we're, we're, we're not just writing out a, a demagogue situation. We have ourselves in, um, in crises with our government internally, uh, externally. So I don't know about the questioning here, but 
I do, okay. That aside, my other, my other real problem is that <laughs> considering he keeps putting out false narratives. And going forward, we're, uh, this is my question to the panel. Let's just say we, we managed to survive this presidency. The next one <laughs> is we're going to continue to see this. We can just write our own story and have alternative facts and put forward uh, our own agenda and stack up our own reality. Is that something that America can govern? In that, in that I, I don't thing. know how to phrase that question. Or something. <laughs> uh, well, the Constitution is elastic enough to withstand anybody. Okay, I, I don't think structurally the uh, government is in any dire straits. Uh, I really don't. I, because I, would, I, would, I would disagree with that because the Constitution, again, is a blueprint, and depending how you use it, now it's a good blueprint, and it is elastic. But again, anything is elastic, but that does not mean it's unbreakable. And I think, I think, to kind of answer your question, I think a lot of it depends on what happens in the next, well, the rest of Trump's term, um, and what happens to, to Trump, and if he is still successful, or if he meets resistance, you know? Because again, it's like, it's like anything else, right? If you engage in a behavior, and you're not corrected for it in any way, um, then that's gonna be something you continue to do, and other people are gonna be watching you, and so yeah, I think that that's, I think that that's a, a possibility. I hope it's not what's going to happen, but it is a possibility. Well, I think he's found out at quite a few turns that he can't just ramrod whatever he wants through. That's, we have separation of powers, checks and balances, and it's worked to a large extent. Right. Nobody's going to suspend the Constitution. Well, what happens, let me follow up then, what happens when you do see one party seem to be more interested in party over policy, over country, over where they're not going after this president for emoluments and other issues. Um, there's a reason why someone who's heavily in debt doesn't pass basic security clearance in the White House. And here, someone who possibly could be heavily in debt to certain entities abroad that may be influencing his decision making because we have no control over that. We have no knowledge. We don't know what's going on behind the scenes. So how do we, how in our Constitution, we're supposed to have all these checks and balances, but I see that the Republicans have no interest in calling him out, making him divest, putting his children in, like I said, in, in power positions. I feel like we Why are, would they? Uh, at the verge of well, I mean, he didn't set the precedent. I mean, there's the Kennedys where he puts his own right. brother as attorney there's general. No, so, I mean, you what know. What benefit is there to them to do that? Right. They have the, you, you know, you run your election to acquire the power, and once you've acquired the power, you do everything to maintain the power. The power is the end game. So where's the morality in that? There isn't any. <laughs> there absolutely isn't any. But I think Daryl's right in that it's, it's, it's unlikely that, barring some massive catastrophe, and I mean huge, it's unlikely that even the American public is, a, a, there, there is a breaking point. I don't know what it is, but there's a breaking point that occurs before the Constitution is finally just torched. We, we've been picking and selecting what was important in the Constitution for generations. The Fourth mean, Amendment is basically non-existent. Yep, anymore. that's true. Would that mean so, that Mueller is fired and then have a You know, if Mueller gets crisis? fired, there's going to be a there there's going to be a lot of questions, and, and, and uh, you know, to hear Lindsey Graham say something about that is kind of like, oh, yes. okay. Yeah. Well, I, I think I think too, it's, it's it's you know, every every politician makes a calculation, and they they're interested in getting reelected. Right? Yeah, yeah. And I think you know for. For Republicans to turn on Trump or, 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 or to, to try and restrict him in any way, um, they're going to have to basically make that mental calculation to say, is this person more of a hindrance to me and my future success, or would my opposition to him create a problem for me? And I think everybody kind of kind of raises that question. I mean, all, all you got to do is, you know, when, when Paul Ryan's making a statement about President Trump, um, you can kind of see him make that calculation as he as he's talking. Um, you can see it in his eyes. He's like, "Oh yeah, that's that's fine. The president can do that." Um, you know, but Trump's going to have to do something to become such a political liability, um, and I don't know if he is going to do that. 
And more importantly, I think it's going to be based on how the electorate responds to the president. And particularly not the entire electorate, but his base and the Republican electorate. Yep. And, and, and right now, and right now um, the you know, Republicans are very, are very uh, pleased with, with Trump. They just did a, they just did a poll in, in Texas uh, about President Trump being competent. And everybody in Texas, when you do, it, when you do the entire population, it's like a 40, it's like a, it, it's, he, he gets like two or three points that he's competent, it's like 48, 46 or whatever. Um, but when you break it down, when you, when you break it down between Republicans and Democrats, um, it's like 85% of Republicans think he's competent. And when you look at Democrats, it's the exact opposite. And weren't we supposed to have a blue wave right. in right. Texas? Well, no, I, we, we did have a blue wave in Texas. It's just that Texas is very red. Um, and for that blue wave to be really effective, it's going to be a really big blue wave. But, you know, Democratic turnout in Texas did increase quite substantially. And if it happens in Texas, in other states where the Republicans aren't as dominant, then yeah, it could be a problem. Okay, I would like to just ask one last question to them because we're basically over time already. But this is my question to each of you, and this is a fun question. It's a hypothetical, and apparently you're gonna probably have people glowing. But uh, based upon your own individual assessment, from a political standpoint, where do you think the country is headed and why? I don't know what that means. Just go with it. <laughs> I'll go. Who brought okay. the ladies first? Yes, <laughs> please. <laughs> I'll play it. Um, I think that uh, depending on the rest of the time in Trump, uh, uh, Trump's term in office, if people start to see the benefits of the economy growing, uh, people, you know, we've been saying it for the last 20 years, people vote with their pocketbook. It's the economy. They're going to vote uh, more based on that than on anything else. And so if it goes well, then I think that it would become, that there would be more electorate becoming more, at least somewhat more conservative, or at least wanting a uh, conservative approach to the financial side. Uh, so that's, that's where I would see it going. Daryl. <laughs> the Republic is in trouble. Uh, even though the Constitution is elastic, I'd say within 10 years we'll have a dictatorship in this country. What? It is fair to say that at least for the foreseeable future, the parties will continue to run away from each other. And that's why it'll happen. Because happen. we have told them that compromise is a dirty word. Mm -hmm. My way is more important than what is good. Mm -hmm. And until we tell them to stop running away from each other, they're gonna run as hard and as fast as they can and we're gonna fuel it with our money and our, you know, our disappointment and our anger and our frustration and it will get faster and faster and they will keep running away from each other. And that frustration will grow so great that people will start reaching for their guns. Well, they will at least get to a point where they're ready to surrender something that they probably shouldn't surrender, and that is the inherent protections in the Constitution that are designed to ensure that the rights given by the Creator are not usurped. And if we start giving that up, that, that, that starts to smell like the end days. Americans don't have that moral fortitude anymore. Well, we better find it. We're not going to find it. It's slipping away. Right, and you're I, last. You this, that. This, this. I know it's it's, it's kind of hard, but but you'll love this. They're both right. Okay, we 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 are a republic, and any republic has a choice. The basic choice is between ballots or bullets, right? Either you come together, you work as a as a republic, you govern yourself and you rule through the elective process, or you don't. And if you don't do that, then you're gonna to have to do something else. And ultimately, anything else is going to have to be regulated and dictated by violence, right? I mean, that's, that's the difference, right? When you look, when you look at countries um, 
that are going through these types of, of political upheavals that, that we're in. We really are, right? We really are as, as a nation, you know. We don't like to talk about it, we don't like to say it, but it's true. There are two paths that you will see. Either you re-energize your democracy, and that might happen, right? Maybe this blue wave are people waking up and saying, you know, maybe I was too complacent, right? And that's what I hope for, and that's a possibility. But maybe Nick is right. Maybe we have broken the system so much that there, 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 there is kind of no hope to that, right? Um, and both of those futures, I think, are possible. But the thing that's important for us today is to realize that we are still in a place where we get to make that choice. We will come to a time, depending on what happens, when that path will be decided for us. But right now, we are not there, right? Right now, we can do something, right? And so really, I think that's what we need to keep in mind. All right, well, thank you for your time. Thank you. <laughs>